All right, hello, like she said, I'm Heather Dewey and my project is Different Strange Eugenics in Latin America. Um, this is a project that I had originally chosen just because usually when people talk about eugenics, what first brings to mind is often the Western European and United States form of eugenics. I'm sorry if you hear me say United States, Ian, that's going to happen occasionally just because in Spanish there is a word for that and I'm so used to having to say that instead that it just makes it easier for me. And the main thing I wanted to research when talking about eugenics is one, why Latin American eugenics needs to be treated as its kind of different creature from what we normally conceive of as a eugenics program. And the second reason was because the more I researched it, the more I kind of found that once you distilled eugenics down to its main cultural elements and the main influencers of eugenics itself, you start to see that the same, those same elements are what ended up influencing healthcare in later um, Latin American countries. In this case, it's just on Chile, Bolivia, and Peru, because they're the countries that aren't often seen in eugenics research, even in Latin America. And honestly, just because I liked those three countries. So <laughs> um, I'm going to get to this part in a sec. The first thing I'm going to explain is I don't know if many of you know what eugenics is or know very much about it. Um, eugenics was kind of this social concept that a nation could shape the people by controlling who reproduced and they could kind of create a population that they believed would be better. Um, a lot of you might have heard about things like what Nazi Germany did or how the United States conducted sterilizations in the 30s and 40s. Latin America, those ideas spread to Latin America but really developed in different ways. So um, the two ways to describe eugenics are positive and negative. Positive does not mean good, it just means um, methods that encouraged reproduction, whereas negative were methods that discouraged reproduction. So one of the main reasons why Latin America um, sort of has a different version of eugenics is you had something um, when colonialism happened called the Costa system. And the Costa system, the name itself is very similar to what you might consider it similar to the caste system. What this was was basically um, your racial mixture determined where you were in the society. And you see on this picture, they only have um, 16 different types showing in this particular picture. There are actually a lot of different subtypes that went along with it. Um, Dr. Butes, please correct me if I start to go off topic here. Um, but what you basically had were people who had mostly European heritage were at the top and tended to receive a lot of the social, economic, political benefits. These were people who could vote. These were people who held land. Um, these were people who could get who could get involved in the economic and social spheres. And as you went down, um, the more indigenous blood you had, the more of a mestizo you were, which was that mixture of indigenous and European blood. And at the very bottom, you tended to have um, people who had African heritage just because the Africans who were brought to Latin America tended to be slaves and therefore were considered at the bottom of the society. And the main reason that this makes Latin American eugenics different from what you see in the United States and Western Europe is because you had a lot more different types of racial divisions than what you would normally expect to see in a European country. Um, the mestizos made up the majority of the population. Um, pure blood um, Europeans or people who had majority European heritage were actually the minority in the society and yet were still the ones receiving benefits. And the reason it's important that most of the society was mestizo is a lot of the Latin American countries, at least the ones that I examined, tended to steer away from negative eugenics because it was a much larger segment of their population that they considered undesirable. In this regard, a lot of Latin American eugenics actually focused on manipulating and changing the environment to try to encourage behaviors that they tended to associate with a better, more changed population instead of going through with things like mass sterilizations of people they didn't approve of. Um, Oh yes, and this is just some geography to let you guys know what I was talking about. Um, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile are right here on the um, western coast of South America. And part of the reason these three countries are also chosen was they had very different racial makes up, makeups. Um, Chile, the long thin one here, actually had one of the um, smallest indigenous populations out of the Latin American countries, or at least like the most stable. There was a little less differentiation between the different indigenous groups that you would see. And in this regard, Chile tended to be mostly positive when approaching eugenics, best because it didn't have to deal with as many racial divides. Um, when you get to a country like Bolivia, Bolivia was and really kind of still is one of the poorer Latin American countries. It tends to be um, federally weak in terms of government power. It also had um, 
a much larger indigenous population and much more tensions between the indigenous population and what you would consider like the European elites. Um, at the time period that I was studying, there was actually something called the Chaco War that had just been fought over indigenous um, rights. So they had tensions from that. And then you had Peru, which was actually governmentally pretty strong and still also had um, some of those racial issues going on. And these three countries, they actually fought in the War of the Pacific between each other on 18, through 1879 to 1883. Um, it was Bolivia and Peru against Chile, and Chile actually ended up defeating both of them and taking a, major, like a huge chunk of their land to themselves. And this created still another problem when it came to looking at eugenics, because there were Peruvian and Bolivian migrants to Chile who were heavily discriminated against in eugenics programs because they were considered the wrong kind of mestizo to have involved in your country. Um, so again, one of the reasons why Latin American eugenics tends to be different is the different types of racism that you encounter. Of course, you had racism in Western Europe and the United States. But like I said again, the mestizo and indigenous populations of these nations made up a much larger chunk of the population. And racism, though it was very explicit through the Costa system, it also tended to be very implicit just in the way people interacted with each other. Um, there was much more um, common interaction between peoples than what you'd see in the very socially stratified societies of the United States and Western Europe. And that tended to create um, systems of racism where there was, of course, overt discrimination, but people just inherently had systems set up to kind of put people down or keep people, people out of the way, which unfortunately for them got very disrupted when people started to move from the much more rural regions into urban centers in the 1930s and 1940s, thus making them even more important. And you had to pay more attention to them because they're now in the cities where these elites are living in. Um, and like I said, there's just some of the racism I mentioned previously. When discussing um, Chile, like I'm going to do further on, it actually had a very interesting double standard where a lot of intellectuals who were also eugenicists had something called the national cult of the mestizo where they tended to praise um, indigenous heritage, but only certain types of indigenous groups. So these groups were considered to be the best bloodline for Chile, but the other indigenous groups were the ones that were discriminated against. And please tell me if I'm confusing anyone, because there's a lot of different grades of this that's going to be going on. And finally, um, the other main reason, sorry, the other main reason why um, Latin American eugenics tends to differ from what we normally consider it is they followed a different idea about what genetics was. So the one that we're more familiar with and that we tend to see in the United States is Mendelian genetics, where we believe that traits are hereditary. Um, you get your uh, hereditary diseases from your parents, you get your appearance from your parents, you get your um, particular traits from your parents. In Latin America, what was actually popular was Lamarckian genetics, where your traits are influenced by your environment. So for instance, you're not an alcoholic because alcoholism runs in your family. You're an alcoholic because you happen to live with alcoholics or you, um, become a prostitute because you happen to live with prostitutes. You're not born to be a prostitute. It's just what happens from what's around you. So one of the reasons that this ends up changing Latin American eugenics is the countries weren't as concerned with changing the actual people as they were with changing the environment around it. And without further ado, I believe I get to actually start talking about the countries themselves. Sorry, there's a lot going into this one. So. Like I said before, what you have with Chile is actually what we would consider almost completely positive eugenics. It was mostly concerned with trying to encourage certain types to reproduce. It didn't really have a lot of um, the negative eugenic movements to try to discourage reproduction as much as it did just try to um, encourage the segments that it wanted to reproduce as much as possible. In particular, it tended to target the growing population of the urban poor. Um, and immigrants that it tried to get in from Europe. And it did this by mostly creating programs like door-to-door -door education and milk banks for new mothers so they could actually get um, what they believed was decent quality milk for, for the children. Um, a very important element of Chilean eugenesis and the others I'm going to talk about is that they, they realized the lower classes had problems but blamed the people and not the society even when they were trying to implement um, new programs. It's this very interesting duality where they realized 
that the living situation that these people had was not good and contributed to a lot of these problems, but they did very little to actually change it. Um, in Bolivia, what we end up seeing is a very similar situation. Um, Bolivia actually had much higher rates of infectious diseases just because of its geography. And these ended up spreading into close living quarters, especially as rural people started to move to urban areas and they ended up in these overcrowded, um, unhygienic regions. Disease started to become rampant. Um, and what happened was eugenicists tend to blame these on what we would call the Indian problem. You can probably guess where that is going. They tended to blame the indigenous population for the problems that they had. And as this started to get worse and as it started to spread through the 1920s into the 1930s, Bolivia actually tried to implement negative eugenics programs, but was unable to do so because it lacked that strong government and it lacked, it was not going to get popular public participation in forced sterilizations that you can't do that without some form of governmental muscle. Most people are not willingly going to subject themselves to, oh, I'm a clearly inferior person. Yes, please sterilize me. I don't think anyone in this room would say that to somebody else. Um, and so what happened was they eventually went back and reverted to trying to have positive movements. And then we have Peru. Um, Peru is actually going to be a very important case for this because like I said, it had a much more stable government. And so when it, it started off positive at first with some of the very similar things, door-to-door -door education, nursing programs, milk banks, um, discounted health clinics, sanitary campaigns, um, their eugenics organ, which was called the National League of Hygiene and Social Prophylaxis, um, was actually very influential and started to gain political power. They were the ones who put these programs into place. And as they tried to maximize the human capital they had available to Peru, they very quickly turned to negative eugenics. Um, and negative eugenics, again, does not inherently mean bad. It just means that they were trying to restrict pop the population by trying to get birth control to become more popular. And this also meant that they tried to get sterilizations to become more popular. Okay, so... In my research, and here's where the modern healthcare comes in, I start to notice that these trends that you see with the eugenics programs, the emphasis on positive, positive to negative to positive, and negative actually become very influential with the way healthcare is developed later on. Um, like I said, Latin America had some very interesting problems when it came to issues of race and in the indigenous population. And what you see as the decades start to spread, and even though eugenics itself kind of fell out of favor in the rhetoric, you see a lot of the similar ideas start to become, kind of start to leak into the healthcare because the intellectuals who had started to use eugenics were the ones in power and did consider it a form of medicine and healthcare, even though it very clearly wasn't. I'm sorry I used the, the scare quotes that you don't like. They considered it healthcare even though it wasn't. And a lot of the ideas that they had, they started to spread into what would become kind of contemporary healthcare. So for instance, what you see in, um, contemporary Chile is that a lot of people are covered by a public fund that kind of is very similar to the public programs that they tried to implement during the eugenics era. But what you also see is that the majority of the people who are supposed to be covered by this public fund, which is sort of the poorer class, um, more indigenous, more mestizo people, tend to be actually left out of a lot of healthcare solutions, which are still restricted to sort of the people who can afford private healthcare and can actually get um, better operations and better access to medicine. In Bolivia, which has had, again, it's still one of the poor Latin American countries, what you see is that 73% of their large indigenous population actually lives in poverty, and 79% of the indigenous population lives in regions that um, have almost no access to health care. So they're once again being left out of solutions that are supposed to um, kind of strengthen the country. Um, and part of this is, again, because it's had a relatively weak government. It has no stable source of power, which, again, mirrors what you would see under the eugenics problem. The um, main one I'm actually going to focus on is Peru, which actually had something that resembles a eugenics program in the 1990s under President Fujimori. And what this was was under the guise of um, extending health care to the indigenous population, the Peruvian government forcibly sterilized 215,000 people, the majority of them indigenous women. And they did so because, um, according to the interviews with the um, women, which you can listen to at this um, program called the um, Kipo Project, 
which I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but the reasons that the women were often told was because they were either breeding like rabbits and destroying the um, country through their massive um, reproduction. They were thought to be like lowering the quality of the Peruvian stock. They were seen as a burden upon the system because they were having five or six kids to work with them out in the regions that they lived in. And really what you see is a lot of this eugenic rhetoric being bought back to try to justify healthcare options that weren't chosen by the people. And this was actually a program that had international funding until people started to figure out what it was actually being used for. And even to this day, the Peruvian government is a bit hesitant in admitting that this happened and still hasn't given actual recognition to the women. So, um, sorry to try to shorten the project into that many different strains. But really what it all came down to when I tried to do this was one, the comparative study between um, Chile, Peru, and Bolivia, where you can actually see how the different types of eugenics became popular. But just the idea that a concept like eugenics has to be changed when you're looking at a different region that has different cultural aspects that are going to influence how it's actually carried out. Um, and again, part of this came out because when you look at the literature, it's very hard to see these differences actually brought out. Um, in fact, with eugenics literature, a lot of these differences didn't become noticed until an author published a book in the 1990s. The author was um, Nancy Lay Stepan in her Hour of Eugenics. And considering that, based on the research, I think that if you distill the eugenics elements down to um, their main cultural forces, you tend to see elements that get influenced, that influence the society later on. And I'm going to end there because I'm getting really nervous now, so. <laughs> Yeah. Bye. Yes, Dr. Olivier. Well, the first thing that actually came to my mind, and this will betray my complete lack of knowledge about Latin America, but I was thinking about um, in Bolivia, uh, President Morales, right? Mm -hmm. He was, he's the first indigenous president, is my understanding, mm -hmm. of Bolivia. Does he, uh, has he said anything about these programs? He's been in power for years now. Has he said anything about these kinds of programs um, and how they may have affected indigenous people in Bolivia? Is this something that still kind of continues there? Is there any kind of recognition of this under a, a president who has a different background than um, other ones? Under the name of the eugenics programs, not necessarily in the intellectual terms, they are actually trying to target some of those cultural elements that made the eugenics rhetoric possible. Um, in particular, like I said, the indigenous population tends to live in the poorer regions that don't have access to um, social rights and health care. And under someone like President Morales, who does come from a different background, you do start to see more of an emphasis on indigenous rights that you really would not have seen during the majority of the 20th century. So I would say, yes, you actually do start to see a recognition of these problems, but not necessarily in eugenic terms. Yes, Dr. Lipschitz. So I kind of assumed that there would be a lot more references to the Catholic Church because you would think that they would have some strong, at least based on my understanding of the Catholic Church, um, um, that they would have some very strong opinions on this, and that would be one of the things that all of these, you know, that these countries mm -hmm. would have uh, would have in common. So do I mean how how does you know how how does the Catholic Church fit into this especially this kind of you know oh, yeah, kind of that rhetoric. was actually one that I ended up cu cutting out of the assignment just to try to make it a little less confusing when trying to present it um the Catholic Church a lot of the proponents of positive eugenics actually came from that more Catholic background because all positive eugenics was really doing was um, doing things the Catholic Church which would, would approve of which was just education trying to encourage women to be stay-at-home mothers trying to um right some of the social ills, trying to curb prostitution and venereal diseases, really those positive programs. Where the Catholic Church actually becomes um, more of an aggressor or more of an opponent is one you kind of see in Peru when the birth control, the birth control battles is actually what I called them a bit in the presentation. Sorry, these were when um, the Catholic Church actively started to kind of rebel against the Peruvian government's um, ideas to spread birth control to the lower classes. And here's where you see much more of an actual like back and forth battle between the two over, no, you cannot give poor people birth control. That's immoral versus, no, we really need to do this for the, better, for the betterment of the nation, so. Um, Professor Combs and then Professor Carr. <clears throat> so you mentioned earlier, I'm sorry if I missed it because I've gotten a little bit, um, 
that there is positive uh, and negative mm -hmm. uh, impact because of the use So, but there's positive does not mean good. Can you explain that a little bit more? The differences, how does it Oh, yeah, um, positive and negative are just terms used um, to describe eugenics. Positive eugenics is methods that were designed to encourage reproduction, and that's why they're called positive, because it meant um, basically a larger population. Negative eugenics were movements designed to curb reproduction, and that's, that's the one that tends to be associated with things like sterilizations, birth control, those more forceful measures that would prevent people from basically reproducing. That's the whole divide between those two. So the divide between the good and the positive is because the positive is only concentrating on that, on that aspect. Yeah, positive tends to be associated with good just because it tends to involve much less forceful measures than you get with the negative eugenics. Yeah, sorry. Yes, Professor Carr. Um, I wanted to thank you for a really excellent uh, presentation. Um, and I was wondering if, if um, you looked at or thought about the ways in which there might be sort of a transnational conversation going on between the um, eugenics movement in Latin America um, and then eugenics in the U.S. and, and Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and and the reason I, I said that is I was thinking, you know, in terms of American progressivism, for example. Okay. I mean, a lot of yeah. those, a lot of the, I mean, a lot, a lot of that movement em mm -hmm. embraced this kind of. Um, Lamarckian genetics, a, a, a new term I learned today. Um, so, and, and similarly, I know later later on during World War II that um, obviously uh, the you know, Nazis were, were trying to um, sort of shore up uh, mm -hmm. a base in Latin America. So I don't know if that's something that you looked at, whether the two um, groups are talking to one another. That's actually an interesting aspect about eugenics that I didn't really have room for when trying to prepare the presentation. Part of the reason why it's hard for Latin America to kind of get its own recognition as it's as having its own eugenic rhetoric is because the um, elites and intellectuals of Latin America for the longest time tended to try to Europeanize themselves. So what they ended up doing was mimicking a lot of the eugenic ideas that you would see in Europe, including, including things like the milk banks or the actual rhetoric itself, and then repurposing it within its old culture. So they had a little bit of a discussion. A lot of it was very one-sided one because Latin America tended to mimic Europe, but Europe did not tend to mimic Latin America, where Latin America would take the general premises of it and then reshape it to fit its own culture. Because like I said, they had a much harder time um, sort of acclimatizing the very strict racism that you would see in Western Europe or the United States, especially because they had a much more mixed population than you would see. In terms of Latin America and the United States, you do actually have a bit more of a back and forth between the two of them. And part of this just, part of it is just because of the geographic closeness. Um, one thing that didn't make it into the presentation was Latin America, well, the Americas in general, actually tried to hold a couple of different international health conferences between one another which the United States um, occasionally attended when it felt like it, but in which there was actually some sort of sharing of the rhetoric that went back and forth. Again, a lot of it was mainly Latin America taking rhetoric and repurposing it, but you do see it, uh, like the Lamarckian um, genetics kind of starting to get implemented a little in the United States as well. Yes. So uh, you mentioned how uh, there's this tendency in many, there was this tendency in many Latin American countries to try to like widen this popu mm -hmm. their population, and it's really interesting all of the internal kind of measures that they took, and I know that in Brazil at, mm -hmm. around that time there were some immigration measures that yeah. made it more difficult for African and Eastern oh, yeah. Asian immigrants. Were those in place too in the countries that you looked at? Um, those actually were. Um in place, what happened was the three countries tried to encourage um, mainly Western European immigrants to please come to their countries and Europeanize their populations. And what actually happened instead was they actually got quite a few, um, and this is gonna be different for each of the different countries. Um, for example, they ended up getting either large amounts of the Jew of Jewish um, people escaping from Europe because, of course, it was the 1930s, or they actually ended up getting um, Italian, Spaniards, Eastern European populations, or actually quite a f um, Peru in particular received a large amount of um, Chinese and Japanese immigrants who ended up working on the railways. So they tried to implement immigration measures, and they actually backfired quite spectacularly on them. So. <laughs>
And that, of course, just increased their desire to try to um, implement eugenic measures because most of those people ended up joining the lower class population. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> All right.